It is a search of almost infinite magnitude. Its goal, unlock the greatest mysteries known to man, from modern monsters to legendary beasts. This is the middle ground between fact and fiction, mystery. Is Loch Ness home to an aquatic beast? Bigfoot, a long lost primate or an elaborate prank? And was there a real Count Dracula? This is where the search ends and mystery begins on Greatest History's Mysteries, Monsters. What is lurking in the world's darkest corners? Dense forests and murky waters. The black tides of a haunted Scottish lake conceal a centuries-old secret. Loch Ness is said to be home to a dragon-like monster. The creature's allure is so strong that in August 2005, hundreds were fooled into believing they had actually seen the monster. In reality, they had encountered a 440-pound animatronic prank named Lucy. We journey now deep into the Scottish Highlands in search of the monster known affectionately as Nessie. We saw this great neck emerge from the water. Uh, about five feet, we estimate, above the water, at an angle, head and neck seem to be one, moving slowly towards the middle of the lock, very rather slowly, uh, for about 20 seconds. It just rose out of the water, black, wet, with the water rolling off it, and I yelled at my husband, stop, the beast. Deep in the human psyche, there exists a need to believe in something fantastic, something powerful, something unknown. Such enigmas lie at the heart of the Great Glen of Scotland. This 60-mile crevice, formed by the awesome flow of glaciers over 10,000 years ago, pierces the Scottish Highlands from coast to coast. At the center of the ancient glen lies a mysterious body of water, 22 miles long and 700 feet deep. It's called Loch Ness. Strange beasts called Kelpies or water horses have long been woven into Scottish folklore. Kelpie sightings in the Loch Ness were recorded as far back as 565 AD. Then, in 1933, Loch Ness and its monster entered the modern age when a young couple's sighting of the mysterious beast was reported in the local paper. More sightings followed, most describing several undulating humps on the water's surface. Other witnesses added details like flippers and a tail, and in a few cases, a head and neck. In October, the larger British newspapers picked up on the story. Within weeks, Nessie was a worldwide sensation, sparking an international debate on the possible origins of such a beast. Theories abounded. Could Nessie be a plesiosaur, a prehistoric creature that had somehow survived extinction and entered Loch Ness from the open sea? or perhaps a giant eel, a whale, or merely a wandering seal. They're looking around, where is this monster? All sorts of stimuli can be seen, ob anomalous objects can be seen on Loch Ness, and of course they are prone to be misinterpreted by those who aren't familiar with them. So there is a strong psychological factor here. People see what they want to see. What newspapers wanted to see was visual proof of the monster. Various popular newspapers of the day offered prizes for a photograph of Nessie. And, of course, once you offer prizes for something, you tend to get it. Not to be outdone, the Daily Mail announced in December of 1933 that it had hired big-game hunter and movie director Marmaduke Weatherall to track the monster to its lair. Within days of his arrival, Weatherall announced his discovery of a mysterious footprint by the water. Excitement was short-lived, however, as analysis of a plaster cast of the print at the British Museum proved Weatherall's find to be nothing more than a footprint of a young female hippopotamus and a mounted specimen at that. You see, it's this shriveled up hunting trophy. And we know, of course, Weatherall's got a house full of these things, you know? The Daily Mail pulled the plug on the expedition and the embittered Weatherall retreated for the time being. But it took only a few months for the Daily Mail to return to the hunt by publishing the photograph destined to become the most famous of all. The surgeon's photo, as it came to be called, was taken by a respected London gynecologist named R.K. Wilson. 
who, with uncommon reserve, claimed only to have taken a picture of something unusual in the lock. Looking at that photograph, you could not see how anybody could have made a mistake. There is a beautiful classic image of an upraised head and neck. It is the image that everybody has of the Loch Ness Monster. A publicity-shy London gynecologist had brought Nessie back to life. In the next decades, technology became the weapon of choice for Nessie hunters. In 1960, scientists armed with echo-sounding gear determined that the lock could support a group of large predators. And in April of that same year, British aerospace engineer Tim Dinsdale became an overnight media sensation when he released to the world 16-millimeter film of what he believed to be the Loch Ness Monster. The photographic analysis unit of the Royal Air Force concluded that the Dinsdale hump was indeed an animate object, measuring over 12 feet long and 3 feet high. Still, the critics would not be silenced. Some insisted that the analysis was flawed and that Dinsdale actually filmed a small fishing skiff. Researchers continued to study the lock. The more they watched, the more they learned about the potentially deceiving natural phenomenon of the lock itself. If you've got a set of weeks coming this way and you cut across it, as the two of them are moving across each other, so the tops are flipping, so it looks as if there's actually something alive on the surface. I thought, finally, I've, I've, I'm seeing the animal, and I'm getting it on film. It's a head and neck. And to my chagrin, in due course, the animal surfaced, head and neck popped up, its body showed, and it flapped off into the sky. So it was a fishing cormorant. So immediately I realized that, especially if there had been a mirage effect, this could be a typical head and neck sighting. The new evidence of mirages and peculiar displays of fluid dynamics on the lock led researchers to conclude that a majority of the sightings in the 1930s were probably just honest mistakes. But once again, new evidence would stir up Nessie fever. In 1967, a cameraman captured the strongest motion picture evidence since Dinsdale. Experts estimated that the visible portion of the object at the head of the wake was between five and nine feet, far longer than any known animal at the lock. Unlike the object on the Dinsdale film, this monster clearly rose and submerged in the water. The advent of sonar and underwater technology meant the hunt for Nessie could finally be taken below the surface. At the forefront of that effort was the Academy of Applied Science, or AAS, led by a Boston attorney and MIT graduate named Robert Rines. And he brought time-lapse cameras, um, flash cameras, to Loch Ness and moored them, um, firing the strobe light into the dark, an underwater ambush, if you like an underwater ambush that would create a firestorm of excitement when in 1972, the team's camera captured what appeared to be a flipper-shaped object cruising past the lens. Energized by their success, the AAS returned to the lock with an improved camera rig in 1975. The result was a new set of photos, including the infamous gargoyle head, which upon analysis seemed to show signs of bilateral symmetry suggesting eye ridges and nostrils. Had the creature of legend finally become reality? Investigators soon found several serious lapses of methodology and interpretation in Ryan's photographic and sonar data. The camera rig, which Ryan's had claimed was, was steady at that time, was in fact rolling about on the bottom of Loch Ness and picking up pictures of all sorts of things, including the bottom of his own boat. The picture that uh, is alleged to show a gargoyle head is more debris on the bottom of Loch Ness. And if you rotate this picture through 90 degrees, it'll be clearly seen that it is debris on the bottom. A few years later, a diver explored the site and discovered a tree stump on the lock floor, bearing a strong resemblance to the infamous gargoyle head, right down to its bilateral symmetry. Then came the most damaging revelation overzealous magazine editors had retouched with an airbrush the famous 1972 flipper photos. 
With Rhines himself now doubting the validity of his 1975 photos, the hunt for the Loch Ness Monster lost much of its hard-won scientific credibility. Then in 1994, independent researchers Alistair Boyd and David Martin uncovered some startling evidence about the most potent and convincing of all Loch Ness icons. Was the surgeon's photo not what it seemed? Since the 1930s, the renowned surgeon's photo had stood as the most recognized image of the Loch Ness Monster. But in 1994, Alistair Boyd and David Martin discovered the shocking truth. The photo was, in fact, a hoax, perpetrated by Marmaduke Weatherall. Weatherall, furious at the Daily Mail for unceremoniously dumping him after his footprint trickery was uncovered, set out to wreak his revenge. He fashioned a two-foot monster out of a toy submarine. He simply did this just to amuse himself. He got his own back on the Daily Mail in his own way. He said, well, they wanted their picture of a monster. Let's give them one. You know, let's give them one. Weatherall needed a solid, upstanding citizen who could claim to have taken the photograph. A fellow conspirator had a friend who liked to play practical jokes, respected gynecologist Robert Kenneth Wilson. All of a sudden, in April, the Daily Mail get offered this wonderful head and neck photograph of the Loch Ness Monster, not by Marmaduke Weatherall, but by a London surgeon called Robert Kenneth Wilson. And they, they go for it, hook, line and sinker. Although he has proven the most cherished Nessie image to be nothing but a vengeful prank, Alistair Boyd maintains that he has not killed the Loch Ness Monster. In fact, he swears he saw the creature with his own eyes. After the thing swept round, this hump came rolling forward. So it's this, there's this huge hump, which is like, like looking at a whale, 20 foot of this thing, just sitting there on the surface, just over 100 yards from us. It's like, it's extraordinary. You cannot believe your eyes. You're looking at something which is in no textbook in the world on natural history. It doesn't exist. You're looking at something that doesn't exist. One thing hasn't changed since the Nessie heyday of the 1930s, the lure of an encounter with the unknown. People come to this mystical spot, hoping to glimpse the Loch Ness Monster. And every year, a few more do. For many, the mystery of the Loch Ness and its monster remains intact. No idea what it was. It was certainly a living creature of some description. But what it was, you, your guess is as good as mine. We like to think it was the monster. <laughs> That's what keeps me fascinated. There's something big here. I want to be involved in finding out what it is. In the dense wilderness of the Pacific Northwest, thousands of eyewitnesses claim to have seen a mysterious creature. They call it Bigfoot. I was running for my life away from this thing, absolutely. It was the scariest thing I've ever come up against. Bigfoot, or Sasquatch as it's known in Canada, um, is reported to be a large bipedal primate. And by that I mean it walks fully erect on, on two legs. It's very muscular and robust, according to the reports. Seven, eight feet tall, covered with hair, has a very large stride and, and can move very rapidly. Reports of man beasts or wild men have appeared in North American newspapers since the 1830s. But the creature we know as Bigfoot leapt into public consciousness in 1958 when a construction crew in Bluff Creek Valley, California, discovered enormous human-looking footprints up to 18 inches long. Plaster casts of the prints were brought to a local newspaper. The story spread like wildfire, and soon more people claimed to have seen a Bigfoot. <laughs> Stories of a giant man-ape roaming the Pacific Northwest attracted the public and cryptozoologists, a small group of investigators who study unknown animals. Richard Greenwell has been on a number of Bigfoot fact-finding missions. We have uh, hundreds of cases of footprint tracks. We have many hair samples that have been collected, fecal remains, uh, of course, hundreds and hundreds, over a thousand eyewitness reports, and recordings of howls and bellows. Could an undiscovered primate lurk in our midst? 
The most widely accepted theory is that Bigfoot is a relic of a prehistoric ape known as Gigantopithecus blackeye. Fossil records indicate that it was around nine feet tall and weighed over 1,000 pounds, matching most descriptions of Bigfoot. This ape lived in, in Asia, in China mainly, um, up to about 500,000 years ago. And so it's possible that it might have crossed the Bering Land Bridge like the North American Indian, Indians did, and come down to North, through North American forests and stayed hidden in the forest here. But there is still some doubt as to whether our North American Bigfoot is a Gigantopithecus or even if it exists at all. For the casual observer and even the most hardened researcher, proof may exist on 952 frames of film, 50 seconds that would indelibly etch Bigfoot into our minds. October 1967, Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin, two Bigfoot enthusiasts, set out in Bluff Creek, California. Inspired by the footprints found in the same spot in 1958, Patterson and Gimlin decided to shoot some background material for a documentary they were making on the elusive creature. What they captured on film amazed them and left the world asking, could it be? A tall, furry, bipedal animal strides away from the two men turning wants to look back at them, and then disappears from sight into the woods. Could this be physical proof that a creature of legend like Bigfoot is actually a real monster? The film is the subject of continuing debate. The Patterson film is either indisputable evidence for the existence of Bigfoot, or it is nothing more than smoke and mirrors, a person in an ape costume. There are a lot of reasons not to believe it. One of the things that's very convenient to what I believe to be a hoax is the fact that it gets blurry in, a, in the right spot, that it's really hard to examine any close details of this, and that they didn't follow the uh, supposed Bigfoot walking away um, at a very doable pace. I've worked with all three of the great apes, the gorilla, the chimp, and the orangutan. This creature moves like an ape, even though it's a biped. The whole upper part of its body is massively muscular. When it turns back to look at the people that are filming it, it doesn't turn its head, it turns the whole upper part of its body. That's because apes can't turn their heads all the way around like we can to look over their shoulders. The shoulders are too massive. The whole feel of the creature is that of an ape. To the cryptozoologist, the Patterson film is only one piece in a very large puzzle. There's various kinds of evidence today to support the existence of, of Bigfoot. Um, the evidence consists, first of all, mainly, of course, of eyewitness reports. We have about 1,500 good reports. On July 15, 1989, Bigfoot eyewitness Skip Fromback a resident of Seattle, Washington, drove his family about 60 miles out of the city. Once out in the deep woods, he separated from the others. All of a sudden, the hill above me just explodes in a fury of action, and I see this big black hairy thing come falling down through the trees, Rambo style, knocking the branches off as it comes down. And it lands in a heap up on the top of the hill, and then begins to bound head over heels down the hillside, approximately an 80-foot fall down through the trees and another 150 feet down to where I was. Fromback fired a gunshot over the animal's shoulder to scare it away. What I did was I fired the shot by the time it had started to rise off of the ground. And this thing didn't rise off the ground like a bear would rise up on all four legs. I saw an arm go out from its left side, one go out from its right side, and then it pushed itself up like a human and flexed its back when it got to the top of its erect stance. From the angle that I was to this creature when it stood up, I got a fairly good look at the side of its face to the point where I could tell that it wasn't obviously a bear. It was some kind of a mountain gorilla or a gorilla-type animal. It made a slight turn and looked in my direction. Then it turned around and walked away like I wasn't even there. Fromback waited 10 to 15 minutes, then began to descend the path down the mountain where he encountered the beast again. What happened next would haunt Skip Fromback for years to come. July 15th, 1989. 
Skip Frombach, alone in the forests outside of Seattle, Washington, encountered the astonishing, a Bigfoot. It seemed disinterested at first, but as Frombach made his way down the mountain, he once again came face to face with the enormous creature. This time, the animal began to chase him down the hill. I was running for my life away from this thing, absolutely. It was the scariest thing I've ever come up against. And I ran until I was physically exhausted, and I thought, I'm going to let this thing kill me because I can't run anymore. And I'd stop, and it would stop. And then I'd run again, and it would chase me again. And it was like it was playing with me. Finally, the creature stopped chasing Frombach about 300 feet from the road where he had parked his car. Battered and bleeding, he gathered his family together and left the area. For Skip Frombach, his alleged encounter with a Bigfoot was as real an experience as can be. Others aren't so sure. I believe a high percentage of people who make these claims believe what they saw. They're not trying to trick people. But they may be being fooled by other people or their eyes or something that they just don't know quite what they're looking at. So is Bigfoot a legend, a hoax, or a real monster? The debate continues. We don't have a body. I mean, if these things are out there and running around for as long as people say they have been, um, we ought to be able to find a dead one so at some point. We haven't found it yet, and uh, I don't think we're going to. What I saw out there, to me, was real. And what I experienced was real, and the terror I felt was real. And there's nobody that's going to tell me different. In 2002, one Bigfoot mystery was solved when it was discovered that the 1958 Bluff Creek footprints were a hoax. It was not a primate, but a prankster named Ray Wallace, who created the giant humanoid footprints by stomping around in a pair of carved wooden feet. For our next great mystery, we trek to the once secret kingdoms of the Far East. High in the Himalayas, a mysterious ice-dwelling creature is said to roam, a monster known as the Abominable Snowman. Eight feet tall, covered with hair, yet strangely human-like, the Abominable Snowman has for centuries been deeply woven into the lore and legend of the awesome Himalayas. The people who live in the region, the Sherpas, call this creature the Yeti. Could an undiscovered mammal, some type of half-man, half-ape, still roam the remote vastness of the world's highest mountains. Well, I think the biggest uh, reason why most scientists are skeptical of there actually being a Yeti is that there really isn't any evidence for it. There have been a lot of sightings, uh, reports of sightings of large creatures up in the mountains in, the, say, the Himalayas or, or even in North America with the uh, Bigfoot. There have also been a lot of sightings of Elvis. Yet similar stories of the wild man and Yeti-like creatures are reported throughout history from around the world. You just wonder, you know, again, country after country after country with the same kinds of reports from people totally isolated from each other. Folklore only stretches so far. Um, it really makes you wonder a lot. The ancient legend of the Yeti continues as current folk belief among the Sherpa people of Tibet and Nepal. A Tibetan book of medicine from the 18th century even describes the curative properties inherent in the flesh of a creature it calls a man-animal. Sherpa villagers often recount tales of Yeti sightings. In 1975, while herding livestock, a Sherpa named Lakpa Dolma experienced a brutal encounter with a large and dangerous creature. While herding livestock high up in the mountain slope, I heard a whistle. I thought it might be my older brother. Then I heard the ground shudder, and there was this darkness right behind me. The creature held me by my clothing and hair from behind and tossed me into a stream. After killing three cows, it crossed the stream and walked off in a strange, twisting motion and disappeared over the ridge. Lakpa Dolma still carries the scars of what she insists was a Yeti attack. She is certain that the creature that attacked her was neither a bear, a snow leopard, nor any other familiar Nepalese animal. Eastern belief in the Yeti has timeless roots. 
but the Western fascination with the subject did not begin until the 20th century, when the first Europeans and Americans began to penetrate the most remote parts of the Himalayas. While leading a failed assault on Mount Everest in 1921, British explorer Colonel C.K. Howard Berry came upon a series of human-like footprints 21,000 feet up in the Lakpala Pass. Intrigued by the bizarre discovery, he included the report in a telegram to a newspaper in India. The story caught the attention of the British press, who quickly dubbed the creature the Abominable Snowman. As worldwide interest in the Yeti grew, other expeditions set out in search of the elusive creature with little success. Until 1957, in a scientific study led by Texas millionaire Tom Slick, Slick's team members weren't publicity hounds. They were scientists and zoologists using tested methods of animal observation. Their discoveries were startling. They found Yeti footprints, hair samples, fecal matter, and even the abandoned sleeping nest of a Yeti, a find closely resembling the beds made by the African gorilla. The Slick expedition also interviewed the Buddhist monks of the Panbushe Monastery, high in the peaks of Nepal. There was one relic that the monks held in highest regard, a mummified limb said to be the actual hand of a yeti. The story of the Pembroche hand is very interesting. What really occurred was Peter Byrne, from a previous expedition, knew that there was a hand of the yeti in the Pembroche monastery. So he went there, he tried to get it, couldn't get it easily, so he got one of the caretakers drunk. While the man was drunk, Peter Byrne took pieces of the Pam Boucher hand. He put him in his backpack. He walked across the border from Nepal into India. To prevent the discovery of his theft, Byrne had replaced the two stolen bones from the Yeti hand with two human bones, rewrapping the entire relic to appear as if nothing had been removed. He gives it to W.C. Osmond Hill, a primatologist with the London University who analyzes it and finds out that this piece of material is from an unknown primate. Uh, a really wonderful discovery that still lasts today. But unwittingly, Peter Byrne's trickery would lead to public doubt of the Pambouche hand's validity. In 1960, Sir Edmund Hillary and Marlon Perkins of TV's Wild Kingdom led their own Himalayan expedition. After examining the hand for themselves, they declared it a hoax, unaware that they were looking at the human bones wired together by Byrne. The real truth may never be known, since the complete hand was stolen from the monastery in the early 90s. Reports of the wild man continue to surface in remote areas of Asia. In 1994, Richard Greenwell led an expedition to hunt for the ape-like creature the Chinese called the Yeren. The evidence he found would reignite fervent interest in the abominable snowman. In the 16th and 17th centuries, Europe was a hotbed of werewolf activity. It was a tumultuous time, racked with irrational fears, superstition, and sweeping religious change. People really are on the brink. Uh, that's when misfortune hits them. And it's all part of society purging itself violently and horrifically when it's under extreme emotional and physical pressure. In a slew of accusations and arrests between 1520 and 1630, more than 30,000 people in France alone were brought to trial, accused of being werewolves. For those unfortunate souls, barbaric torture and burning at the stake were often their ignominious fate. Some experts believe there are logical explanations for the werewolf paranoia of the 16th and 17th centuries. Werewolf delusions may have been caused by a mental illness called lycanthropy, in which a person actually believes he or she changes into a wolf, or by an LSD-type hallucination brought on by a fungus called ergot, which infected rye bread during cold winters. It affects the brain. People go quite nuts. They run around and, and you know, act crazy. And there, there have been murders, berserk situations uh, that have been attributed to people eating this poison. Two rare medical disorders may have also perpetuated the werewolf myth. One, hypertrichosis, causes increased hair growth all over the body. The second, porphyria, 
causes increased sensitivity to sunlight. Somebody like this might tend to come out late at night if they had a lot of damage to their tissues, tend to hold their hands in a clawed up position. If the tissue was lost from their lips, their teeth would be more exposed. Uh, and there would be this brownish color which people might associate with blood. I think it's a mistake to go look for uh, rational explanations, because on some level it's not. People have always been fascinated with the, uh, the blurred boundary, you know, between human beings and animals, especially of um, uh, the fear of the beast within. Rational explanation or not, the werewolf holds a prominent place in our past, and its mystery endures, tapping into the animal within us all. And all civilization has probably been a story of, you know, keeping uh, certain impulses and emotions and, and, uh, and urges uh, in, in check. And most of these are the, uh, um, the more primitive instincts, the animal instincts. So ever since man started becoming civilized, you know, the werewolf has been lurking somewhere back there in, in, in the shadow. Stories of vampires are a part of cultural lore told for hundreds of years. And pop culture continues to fuel the mystery. Since it was first published in 1897, Bram Stoker's Dracula remains one of the world's most popular and frightening works of fiction. Dracula has continued to fascinate readers with its indelible image of evil, the myth of the vampire personified. A man who must consume the blood of the living to survive, and in doing so, recruits them to his own ranks of the undead. There's no civilization that hasn't had some variation on the idea of the vampire or the being that comes back from the grave to feed on the energy or the blood of, of, of living people. In writing Dracula, Bram Stoker came across centuries-old vampire stories and superstitions from Transylvania, an isolated country part of present-day Romania. Death and disease hysterias were common. Those thought responsible were branded as vampires, even after they were dead and buried. When somebody was suspect, that they were doing some harm to the village or the villagers. They would open the casket, and in those days there was no embalming. And the very process of the decomposition of the body makes the faces bloat, so they look full. Some of the blood backs up from, the, from some of the internal organs, so it would be very natural for blood to appear around the mouth. And so, you know, Two and two is five. <laughs> oh, that, must, that person must have been out, you know, feeding upon the living. To ensure that the vampire could not return, the legends said the corpse could be decapitated or burned. But there was another method that became the iconic image of keeping the undead where they belonged. One of the ways of dealing with the vampire was keeping it in the grave. And one of the ways you kept it in the grave was by pinning it to the ground. In combing through vampire lore, Stoker discovered that truth is more gruesome than legend. Such was the story of a real blood drinker from Transylvania, a 15th century despot who was responsible for the murders of tens of thousands of innocent people, Vlad the Impaler. To Stoker, he would be a human inspiration. The sordid story of Vlad the Impaler began as a classic tale of revenge in Wallachia, a tiny country in what is now Romania. In 1447, the governor of Hungary, with the support of Wallachia's elite class, the Boyers, ordered the assassination of Vlad's father, the ruler of Wallachia, and Vlad's brother, next in line to the throne. 17-year-old Vlad took control of the country, but only for two months. He was unable to consolidate his power and fled. Hungarian-backed Vladislav II became the new prince. In 1456, after seven years in exile, Vlad gained enough support to kill Vladislav II and regain the Wallachian throne. It was time for Vlad to avenge the murders of his father and brother. Hungary's governor had just died, leaving the boyars to be dealt with. 
Prince Vlad held an inaugural celebration at his new palace. He invited 500 boyars along with the region's five bishops. After a day of festivities, Prince Vlad ordered all his guests, their spouses, and their attendants impaled. Impalement is a lost art. It's where you stick somebody up on a stake or pole. Somewhat like crucifixion. It's a terrible way to die. That's ruled by fear. Very effective. It's not very moral, but it, keeps, it kept people in line then. The innocent were slaughtered along with the guilty. His victims were left as examples for all to see. He would be known by a new name, Sepish, Romanian for Impaler. But the ultimate reputation of Vlad Sepish would be based on even greater acts of depravity. While he was dining amid his impaled victims, first he would have the blood from his victims gathered in bowls. Then he would dip the bread in the blood and slurp it down, basically. This was the character that fascinated Bram Stoker, a real blood drinker. Then, Stoker discovered that Vlad the Impaler had another name. He never signed his name Vlad the Impaler, or he never called himself that. He called himself Vlad Dracula. And we have two documents surviving from Sibiu, which is a town in Transylvania, where he clearly had his name signed, Vlad Dracula. Vlad the Impaler was the real Dracula. It was a name he inherited from his father, who was christened into a special order to fight the Turks. His father was named Dracul. And the name Dracula, that means son of Dracul. Stories of Vlad the Impaler's reign of terror circulated throughout Europe. Some included his real name, Dracula. Vlad's armies continued to battle Turkish forces, with Vlad ordering the impalement of thousands of Turkish prisoners and political enemies. He was finally captured in 1462 and spent 12 years in prison before being killed mysteriously in 1476. The Impaler was finally dead. Vlad left behind an astonishing trail of carnage. He tortured and murdered over 40,000 men, women, and children. He killed an even greater number of Turks. But the saga of the real Dracula did not die here. In 1931, an expedition led by the Romanian government excavated Dracula's tomb. But when that grave was opened up, the crypt stone taken off, casket and body were missing. Animal bones were found in the grave, not the bones of a human being. The real Dracula did survive the grave. Vlad's name and story so impressed Stoker, he changed his vampire character from Wampir to Dracula. At its core, Dracula is more than a good horror story and more than the tale of the brutal prince of Wallachia. Bram Stoker wrote about vampire myths found in almost every culture in the world and about raw human urges and desires. He exposed himself to blood. Dracula can be as promiscuously sexual as he chooses. Dracula has wealth, power, eternal youth, instant hypnotic control over the opposite sex or the same sex. A castle in Europe, great wardrobe. I mean, it's the American dream. In 2001, plans were announced to build a Dracula theme park in Romania. While they have yet to break ground on the $60 million attraction, the most likely name will be Dracula Land. Thanks for watching the History Channel. I'm Scott Bakula.